Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I'm really excited to bring back James Turk, the founder and chief executive officer of Gold Money, the most credible place to buy gold, silver, platinum, and palladium on the internet. These metals are stored in different countries in allocated storage. He is probably the most prominent person to talk to about the history of metals, the functionality of metals, the storage of metals, and the economy of metals throughout civilizations. He's also the founder and chairman of the Gold Money Foundation that is there to educate people about the role of metals throughout history and why, in fact, gold is money and currency. He has a background in international banking and investments. He's a graduate of George Washington University with a BA degree in international economics. And his business career began at Chase Manhattan Bank, now J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the Yoda of the metals industry, James Turk. Welcome back to It's Rainmaking Time. Hi, Kim. It's a pleasure to speak with you, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I have no idea how you got away from me for three years, but we have to stop this. <laughs> well, the, the time has flown. I didn't really realize it had been three years, but I guess we both <laughs> Well, I think the first thing I would like you to share with the audience, since you do live in Spain, is your take on the condition of Spain's economy and what's going on there. I think it would be better to hear from you about this. Yeah, I actually live in London, but spend a lot of uh, holiday time in Spain is really what it is. Okay. The, the, the Spanish economy is just deteriorating rapidly. You know, the, unofficial, un, uh, the official unemployment rate um, is around 24%. Um, the youth unemployment rate is officially around 52 percent, but you know, by most con uh, consensus, the, the the numbers might be a little bit higher. Um, but there is a black market economy as well, so you know, some people do you know survive uh, in the uh, you can call it the black market economy or the free economy, you know, outside of of, of government uh, control. But however you measure it, the the Spanish economy is just doing very very poorly. Um, and they're taking all of the wrong steps. You know, they're not really solving the problem. They're trying to keep the existing um, uh, system going, but it's it, it's they have to address the core issue. And the core issue is that the banks in Spain are basically insolvent. Uh, the real estate bubble, as bad as it was in the States, uh, was probably um, at least two times worse in Spain. Um, and the problem is, is that the Spanish government allowed the banks to continue carrying this overvalued real estate uh, on their books because if they allowed it to go down to market value, a lot of the banks would be taking big losses and would become insolvent. Uh, so they still haven't cleaned up the real estate mess. And, you know, that's how it differs from the U.S. Uh, in that sense. The U.S., I think, is much um, more proactive uh, and quickly responded to the overvalued real estate and even though the U.S. has got some problems still, um, you know, the, the Spanish banks are basically, and the Spanish government are still very, very far behind in sorting out the, the real estate mess. So they've got a, a long way to go, in my view, uh, before they solve the problem. And obviously this has an impact on Europe. You know, what will happen in Spain and what does it mean to Europe? And, you know, that's the big question going forward from here because it, it seems almost impossible uh, for the Span uh, for Spain to remain in the euro, given the present circumstances. What do you think about Greece as well? Greece is in a similar position. Well, Greece is in a similar position, but Greece is tiny. You know, you had Greece, Portugal, and Ireland together. Um, and there's still something like only, you know, one-third of the problem of Spain. Spain is the fourth biggest economy in the uh, in the whole eurozone. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem like Greece, but it's a much, much higher magnitude. Uh, and that's why uh, it's really a dagger pointed right at, right at the heart of the, of the Eurozone. And, you know, the problem is, is that the Euro has become politicized. Uh, you know, governments are trying to do this and do that rather than just letting the market take care of itself. Um, if the Euro were a neutral tool in commerce instead of one that's been politicized by government decisions to buy bank paper and to make loans and, and do, you know, a variety of different things. Um, it, it's ultimately, you know, created the opportunity for uh, a major blow up, which is quite unfortunate and pretty worrying. Do you think that's going to hyperinflate? I think there's a good possibility of it. You know, there are four 
areas that could hyperinflate uh, the U.S. dollar, the uh, British pound, the euro, and the Japanese yen. Uh, it's a horse race as to which one's going to actually hyperinflate first. Um, I could make an argument for any one of the four being the first one to actually hyperinflate. But, you know, the bottom line is they're, they're taking those steps that cause hyperinflation, which is basically taking, uh, you know, government debt and turning it into currency. They're not turning it into cash currency like uh, Zimbabwe did a few years ago or Weimar Republic uh, did in Germany back in uh, the 1920s. They're turning it into deposit currency, which is what happened in Latin America, Brazil, and Argentina uh, back in the 1980s and early 1990s. But regardless whether you have a cash currency economy, you know, where commerce is conducted mainly by, you know, paper banknotes, or a deposit currency economy where money is moved around uh, in payments uh, by, you know, checks, wire transfers, plastic cards, and um, uh, electronic funds transfers, regardless whether it's cash currency or deposit currency, when you turn government debt into either cash currency or deposit currency, ultimately you have hyperinflation. And there's been no indication that either the ECB, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, or the Bank of Japan um, have uh, turned around from this policy of turning government debt into currency. And when, if you keep going long enough in this direction, ultimately you're going to hyperinflate the currency, which essentially means the currency is going to be destroyed. A few years ago when we did the interview, I asked you if you really believed that free markets existed, and you said, yes, they definitely do exist. And I want to come back to this for a moment, because when you think about the fact that derivatives have entered and infiltrated the marketplace and what is going on today, it looks like there's been such synthetic intervention in the markets that it's almost like there's been an intrusion into the normal way of doing business and functioning. And therefore, in a way, we don't have a free market anymore. It even seems worse now. Your answer to me a few years ago was this. Yes, there is a free market. When two individuals interact with one another and they do so without the force of government, they're operating in a free market. They don't have to use a national currency to transact. They can use other currencies to transact. But as far as government involvement is concerned and markets in general, free markets are becoming imperiled by government actions. My question to you, is it imperiled now or is it completely ruined? Yeah, I think my answer is basically the same thing in the sense that two individuals can interact with one another um, and agree to a transaction completely outside of you know government control or government regulation, and that's where the free market exists. But I, I will say that the, what we consider to be the markets, you know, whether it's the uh, the stock market or the gold market or the currency market or the interest rate markets uh, that are generally reported in the in the media. Uh, they've become more imperiled. In other words, there's been more government um, intervention, um, more politicization of the whole market process, and um, ultimately that that that's bad uh, because uh, when you put impediments in the free market process, it um, it distorts you know economic activity, uh, and when economic activity is distorted distorted, you know we all suffer. You know, politicians talk about doing this for the common good, which is really, um, you know, sounds good, but really it doesn't hold water in terms of what the common good really is. The common good is maintaining the rule of law and letting every individual um, pursue, you know, as Thomas Jefferson said, the pursuit of happiness uh, and do it within, the, again, the rule of law, that you don't uh, do any damage or you don't, you know, uh, impair anyone else's rights. When politicians make decisions to intervene in a market, supposedly for the common good, they're actually acting completely the opposite of the common good. Because when you intervene in the market, you're destroying the free market process. You're imperiling the free market process. And sadly, this has become, I think, more um, uh, prevalent than it was three years ago. And it's just, again, to me, an indication that we're going in the wrong direction and that ultimately there's going to be a blow up, you know, whether it occurs, you know, next year, next month, three years, five years, I don't know, but we're heading toward the cliff. And what we have to do is turn um, around 180 degrees and start heading back in the right direction. But I don't see any indication that um, um, that's happening anywhere in the world, which is really quite unfortunate. 
Do you think that shorting the market or shorting a stock is good business economics? Well, I think there's a legitimate reason for shorting. Uh, if you're a trader and you're adding liquidity to the market, you know, if you see an anomaly in the market that something is overvalued, um, and you're free to act um, and and put your money at risk. Uh, you make a choice, you make a decision, and you hope it's the right decision and the right choice. Uh, but, you know, ultimately you have to um, accept the personal responsibility of the decisions that you make. Uh, I'm not in favor of, you know, banks being got bailed out by taxpayer money, uh, uh, taxpayer money. Um, you know, they've made their decisions. If a bank makes a bad decision, the shareholders um, and the people who are in that bank making those decisions should suffer the consequences of those bad decisions. Um, they shouldn't rely on the government, you know, to bail them out. You know, the beauty of capitalism is what uh, Schumpeter uh, uh, called uh, creative destruction. You know, things change. I mean, even if you look back, you know, the past 20 years or so, you know, how things have, have changed and evolved. Uh, the technologies change things, it's improved things. But is to the extent that you have government intervention um, um, acting for the benefit of, of a few uh, rather than for the, and individuals um, acting and creating a level playing field, you're ultimately imperiling you know, the free market process, and that's bad. The reason I asked you the question about shorting the market is that there's something insidious about betting on a company's suffering or some event that's going to come around in the future, betting on the suffering, and that the fact that you can do that and make money creates to me a tremendous conflict of interest so that many companies could get into the business of causing suffering because they've placed a bet on shorting something. And you can see this ever so clearly with weather derivatives. And that's why I asked you that question. My next question is... Well, just before yeah, you go on, yeah. for the next question, sure. I wouldn't use the word suffering. Um, I would use the word that, you know, in a world where people make choices, yeah. uh, companies are making a choice and there are other people who think that that's the wrong choice and they want to take the opposite side of it um, and they and they sell a, a stock. I don't see anything wrong with that and I wouldn't call it suffering. Okay, so uh, if I bet that, let's say, American Airlines is going to, let's say, lose, right? It's betting on the loss of something, right? It's Isn't betting it? on choices. If you're betting that American Airlines or any company right. is making the wrong decisions or making the wrong choices, it's your right to, to choose something else, uh, not only just to fly another airline if you don't like the service or products that one airline is giving, but you know to put your money at risk um, in the free market process uh, with some different choice instead of buying a, a share of a company you choose to sell it short. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. I guess what it is is probably you're referring to the ability to have that free market choice to do it. And I'm mostly referring to when you're making a bet on the loss of something, what that invokes in the human condition. That's all. So well, it's again, it's, yeah. you don't know whether you're going to win or lose uh, when you, when you put your money at risk, but that's what it's called. Yeah. You know, you're either buying a stock, hoping it goes up or you're selling a stock thinking that it might go down. Um, but nobody can predict the future. And the beauty of the market process is that you have all of these actors making decisions. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we humans progress because of the spontaneity of the way the market process works. In 2009, you said that the above the ground stock was 160,000 metric tons, and it was growing by 1.7% annum. And to new wealth creation and world population growth. And I was wondering where it is now. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up. The Gold Money Foundation is going to be releasing uh, very shortly a study that I've completed. Um, it's uh, analyzing the um, importance of the above ground gold stock and the size of the above ground gold stock. And um, the above ground gold stock, according to um, our uh, analysis is about 156,000 metric tons of, of gold uh, exists uh, in the world. And it's still growing about that same percentage. Uh, the average over the last 50 years, I think it was is something like 1.8% per annum. And that's approximately equal to world population growth as well as new wealth creation. So over long periods of time, 
you know, gold has this consistency of, of purchasing power. An ounce of gold buys the same amount of crude oil, you know, it did 50 or 60 years ago. And I like to also use the example that, um, you know, growing up as a kid in the 1950s, uh, my parents could drive the family car into the gas station and fill it up with two silver dollars. Well, today you can still fill up the, the family car with the silver content of two silver dollars, um, but not the face value of two silver dollars. So silver, too, preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. But that's what, one of the most fundamental and important um, um, aspects of, of what money is. You know, Money does several things. One of the most critical ones is that it enables us to um, uh, perform economic calculation, you know, measure the prices of goods and services. But it also, uh, a, a sound money enables us to preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. Um, and this example of crude oil explains why gold is not an investment and why it's money. You know, an ounce of gold purchases the same amount of crude oil that it did 50 or 60 years ago. Who wants an investment like that? You didn't increase your wealth. You just preserved it, which is exactly what money is supposed to do. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. No matter what the state of the economy is, there will always be time-honored traditions and special events. The Sterling Hut has been in business since 2008, offering a wide range of fantastic sterling silver products, including finely crafted mint julep cups, personalized baby shower gifts, photo albums, exquisite jewelry boxes and awards, and so much more. The Sterling Hut is an authorized Silver Star international reseller of fine silver products and anniversary gifts. The business is owned by Jewel and Bob Howard. If you would be interested in buying someone a gift of pure sterling silver or sterling plated silver, you can call 1-888-819-1009. Get a 15% discount by going to the Sterling Hut, the Sterling, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G, Hut, H-U-T, dot com, and saying it's rainmaking time. They will honor a 15% discount for you. Beautiful sterling silver gifts for all of life's occasions, manufactured in Italy and handcrafted by skilled artisans. They can also be engraved in sterling picture frames, oval and rectangular silver trays, champagne ice buckets, silver goblets, coffee and tea service, coffee pots, silver mugs, candelabras, and silver jewelry unrivaled in design and style. Go to the Sterling Hut at sterlinghut.com. Why is it that financial planners and accountants are the last people to be advising their clients to get into metals to preserve the purchasing power of their earnings? Well, there are a couple of aspects. The, from a specific element of it, um, you know, government regulation um, has basically been very unfavorable toward the precious metals um, for a variety of different reasons. And anybody who has a government license basically has to, um, uh, you know, relay the government point of view or they jeopardize losing their license. The second, more broader issue is that we're in what we call, or what I call, a, a fiat currency bubble. Um, and when you're in a bubble, uh, you're basically um, relaying to others the conventional wisdom. And the conventional wisdom today with regard to gold, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's been doing so well over the past decade, is that it's, it's a, a risky uh, investment, volatile commodity, no role to play in a portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all of the, uh, the so-called conventional wisdoms you hear about gold but when the fiat currency bubble finally breaks and pops, um, you know, people will understand that, you know, gold's been money for 5,000 years. It's still money. It may not circulate as currency as it once did, but it's money because it's useful in economic calculation, you know, to measure the prices of goods and services. And it preserves purchasing power over long periods of time. And that the volatility comes from national currencies, not from gold. I like to use the example, uh, and I do, in the, the study that I just completed on the above ground gold stock, I use this example. You know, if you're standing on a, on a, uh, in a, in a rowboat out in, um, in an ocean that's a little bit rough and you, you see the shore, um, you know, what's really moving? Is it the shore that's moving or is it the rowboat? Obviously <laughs> the rowboat, 
<laughs> but you know, people don't understand that by being in the rowboat, you're, they're calculating using currencies as opposed to the shore, which is the rock solid, you know, gold. Um, and it's just a, a matter of perceptions. But when you're in a bubble, you know, people lose sight of the basics. And just like we've done in other bubbles, you know, in the internet bubble, they said profits don't matter, only market share does. That bubble popped. Then in the real estate bubble, everybody said, well, housing prices only go up. You know, that p- bubble popped. Now, the fiat currency bubble is that, you know, people are saying that, you know, the dollar is money. It's not money. It's only a money substitute. Because in our society, what pays for goods and services are other goods and services. You know, tangible assets pay for tangible assets, in effect. If you use credit, which is what a national currency is today, you're not paying for a good or service. That good and service is not, uh, that payment is not extinguished until the guy who's receiving the credit ultimately purchases some some tangible good or service for it. And what we've seen over the past 40 years as this fiat currency bubble has uh, become bigger and bigger is there's more and more credit outstanding. Uh, and ultimately, you know, this is create, creates the opportunity uh, for people who understand gold to recognize that this fiat currency bubble is going to pop and that one way to get across the valley, uh, to get to the other side of the valley, um, uh, is to own physical gold and physical silver because they do preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. And ultimately, they will reassert themselves as money. You know, they've been money for 5,000 years. We've been playing around with fiat currencies for 40 years. Fiat currencies um, always get destroyed uh, because they become politicized. Um, they're over-issued, um, and ultimately, you know, uh, people lose confidence in them. And they go back to basics. And one of the most basic things with regard to money is, of course, gold and silver. I think it's very interesting that accountants and financial planners almost never discuss with their clients the loss of purchasing power with respect to a whole system's context in managing or advising about what people should do with their money. And the fact that that conversation is most of the time never had tells me that we need a whole new cadre of people managing money. Do you agree? Um. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, um, and, but again, I, I don't really blame, you know, accountants or financial planners, you know, because basically, uh, as I say, you know, they're just relaying conventional wisdoms and what they've been taught to relay. So it, 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 there's a bigger picture issue that we have to address. Um, you know, human society in a very large way has become too reliant upon government rather than where we should be reliant, which is upon ourselves, you know, to think through, you know, how do we improve our situation in life? How do we fulfill our needs and wants? You know, how do we protect ourselves and our families from an uncertain future? Um, so, you know, that's ultimately what we have to go back to, so, you know, basically self-reliance and personal responsibility um, and less reliance on government. And I think that will happen, you know, in due course. Since I spoke with you last, uh, there is a new location in Canada to store gold money right? Yes. And that's great. And uh, since we spoke last, I learned in that interview with you that Sir Isaac Newton created the gold standard. (laughs) Yes. That was an amazing discovery. I don't think most of us know that. I want to go back to why it is that you say that there's a difference between gold and other commodities. It's different than other commodities because gold is accumulated but it's also suppressed. Now, how is it suppressed? How does the suppression of gold manifest itself? The suppression comes, you know, from, again, you know, government intervention in the market process. And it basically comes two ways. It comes from propaganda, you know, anti-gold statements, uh, you know, uh, continuing the myth that gold is a barbarous relic. Uh, But, you know, even Keynes didn't call gold a barbarous relic. He called the gold standard a barbarous relic. Uh, because he wanted to remove the discipline on on the government printing press, which is you know ultimately where we are today, and we're heading in the wrong direction. But uh, the other thing, of course, is that from time to time, the government removes central banks remove some gold from their vaults and sell it into the market, you know, to give the appearances that they are in control of the market. But you have to remember that you know gold is an asset. The market controls the prices of all assets. Let's use the example of Picasso paintings, which is one that you know, I often refer to. Let's assume that you know, the government had 10% of all of the Picasso paintings in the world, and they thought that uh, they wanted to, for whatever reasons, be anti-Picasso. 
So they propagandize against it, say the paintings are terrible, and every once in a while as the price goes up, they might pull one out of their vault and sell it uh, you know, to put some substance behind their words. But eventually they're going to run out of gold in their vaults. And in any case, if the market likes Picasso paintings, the market's going to bid them up regardless of what the government is saying. And it's the same thing with gold. You know, people understand the advantages that gold offers. Um, the fact that it has this 5,000-year history, the fact that it preserves purchasing power, you know, for the reasons that we explained earlier, um, that um, the, the, the suppression is unfortunate because it distorts the free market process. But if you recognize that it's going on, you can, you can deal with it um, and plan your strategy you know, to protect yourself and your family and your wealth um, against it. And what I've been consistently recommending is that you know, avoid all of the noise, recognize that gold is undervalued, and every month um, or every other month or every quarter, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, is regardless where the price of gold is or where the price of silver is, if you're inclined to buy some silver too, just go ahead and buy it and do a, a cost averaging basis. And over long periods of time, you're going to be very happy that you did that because what you're doing is you're saving money. And everybody has to save money for the future or to buy a consumer good or retirement or whatever, a rainy day. But it, when you're accumulating gold and accumulating s silver, you're basically saving sound money. And that's the best thing to do because it doesn't make sense to save fiat currencies in this world, particularly in a zero interest rate policy, because you're actually losing purchasing power when you accumulate any national currency. I was speaking with two investors yesterday, and they said to me, gold goes up and down. It fluctuates. And so we don't know what to do. And I said, that always happens. That's just done in the marketplace. And I explained what you've explained and wrote about. But do you have anything to say about the fact that people will say, gold fluctuates, I don't know where it's going to go. It could go down again. Yeah, well, it goes back to my you know, example before. You know, do you want to be in the rowboat or do you want to be on the land? You know, when they say gold is fluctuating, they're in the rowboat. Uh, rather than where they should be, which is standing on the land watching the boat bob up and down. You know, in a world of floating currencies, currencies go up and down relative to each other, depending on what a central bank is doing in any one country versus another country. But all of the national currencies are sinking relative to gold. In other words, they're losing purchasing power relative to gold. If you look at gold against you know the major currencies, they've all declined at double-digit rates since the beginning of this century, you know, 11 years now. Uh, 17.7% decline on average against the U.S. dollar, but all of them are at double digits. Um, it's gold that uh, is solid. It's the currencies that fluctuate. But because people calculate prices of goods and services in terms of dollars, they, they're grabbing the wrong end of the stick. You have to calculate prices in terms of gold as well, just like I was doing before um, a uh, of crude oil prices, but you have to look at all prices in the, in that sense. It's I know it's very difficult to do because you know we're used to thinking in terms of a national currency, but it's like you know an international businessman who can speak several languages has an advantage. The individual today who can calculate the prices of goods and services in terms of a couple of different monies, he also has an advantage. If he's calculating the price of goods and services in terms of gold, and he truly understands what's happening. We're, I guess another way of saying this, Kim, is that we're in a, like a 1930s scenario. Definitely. Yeah. You know, the prices, when you calculate the prices of everything in terms of gold, everything is deflating, just like it did in the 1930s. But in the 1930s, prices deflated in dollar terms, too, because the dollar was legally defined as a weight of gold. So, but this time around, it's different because the dollar is no longer um, legal, legally defined as a weight of gold. It's whatever the government and central banks want it to be. So you're seeing inflation in terms of prices when you measure them in terms of dollars, but you're seeing deflation of prices when you see them in terms of gold except, you know, basic commodity prices, um, because, you know, essentially commodities are consistent in terms of gold's purchasing power over long periods of time. But other prices like housing prices, um, uh, uh, clothing uh, prices, computer prices, electronic prices, those are all deflating in terms of gold. And that's the natural state. In a, in a, a gold-based economy, um, the purchasing power of gold uh, – improves over time because of technology. Um, technology will uh, raise everyone's standards of living 
even though as a salary, for example, you're receiving the same amount of gold every every year, your standard of living improves because technology brings goods and services to you at a lesser cost and brings you new goods and services that also improve your standard of living. That's what happens in a true free market economy, one that's unfettered by government regulation um, and uh, you know where they serve the, the interests of a few rather than enabling the interests of every individual uh, to operate on a level playing field under the rule of law. In 2009, when we spoke last, you had two aspects running simultaneously with gold money at goldmoney.com. You had the accumulation side, the storage side of the metals where you could purchase that, but you also had the transaction side. And I can't remember if it was a year ago, but you retired temporarily the transaction side, maybe because most people were accumulating and not transacting. I have been extremely excited about and really want to see the transaction side happen because to me, that is where the next level of commerce is going to be for people that really are ready to do it. And the thing is, I know that the regulatory pressures on you and on the company have been immense, but do you see the transaction side coming back into play? Yeah, I do. Um, And, there's something more fundamental here when you look at the transaction side. There, there was, and give you a little bit of background on this, because um, this concept is not new. It's been around for a long time. In fact, um, uh, an advisor to Queen Elizabeth of the first sort of um, put it into a, a, a stated principle. Uh, his name was uh, Sir Thomas Gresham, and he um, expounded upon what ultimately became known as Gresham's Law, which is essentially that uh, bad money drives good money out of circulation. And what it essentially means is that when you have money, you do two things with it. You either save it or you spend it. Gresham's law means you save the good money and you spend the bad money. And we're in an environment where Gresham's law is, um, is going full force. People are saving the good money, which is gold and silver, and they're spending the bad money, which is national currencies. Now, at some point in time in the future, when the fiat currency bubble pops, um, I think that uh, is going to change, that uh, gold and silver will once again be spent as currency. Um, Gold and silver will probably become relatively overvalued at that moment in time. So it would make sense to, you know, at some future date, spend the gold and silver that you're accumulating now. Spend it on a consumer good, you know, buy a house, uh, spend it to make investments in other undervalued assets at some future date. But, you know, that's that's at some point in time in the future. You know, when I did an interview back in Barron's in 2003, I thought this would probably all come to um, a head in 2013 to 2015. And, you know, we're getting pretty close to, to that time frame. And I see no reason to change it. And I think, you know, maybe this is all finally going to come to a head. The fiat currency bub- bubble will pop sometime between the 2013 and 2015 time frame. I just don't know. Nobody knows because you can't predict the future. But what we do know is we do know when an asset is overvalued or an asset is undervalued. And the key to successful investing and wealth accumulation is to accumulate those undervalued assets and get rid of the overvalued assets. And right now, gold is undervalued, um, which is, again, you know why Gresham's Law applies. Uh, Gold is the good money that's being saved, and national currencies are the overvalued bad money that's being spent. I want to ask you about the FDIC. You said back in 2009 the FDIC is insolvent and that paper money is not wealth. When confidence goes, people exit the currency. Isn't this what's happening now, even within countries around the world? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, at the end of the day, wealth is really tangible assets. Uh, you know, it's farmland, it's oil wells, it's a, it's a house, it's an office building, uh, it's timberland. Uh, you know, it's ultimately tangible assets that are wealth. And anything that's a financial asset really isn't wealth in the true sense. Um, it's, um, uh, it, it's sort of a, a marker for future spending or future purchase of, uh, of wealth. And what you have during a financial bust, financial assets tend to be destroyed. Um, financial assets have what's called counterparty risk. The value of that financial asset is dependent on someone's promise. Um, but in, um, uh, in a bust, those promises tend to be broken and financial assets, uh, disappear. But, you know, the wealth 
is still there. Uh, the wealth of a farmland, you know, the wealth of an oil well. The other thing, though, that happens during a bust is that um, overvalued tangible assets come down to a more realistic level. So, for example, you know, if homes were built on speculation and made no financial sense at the previous level of valuation, uh, that the wealth will still be there, in other words, the home, but the money that was spent on it, a lot of it was just wasted and is going to come back to a much more realistic level. And we're still seeing that process taking place. You know, we started talking at the beginning about that's what's going on in Spain. It's still going on in many parts of the world that overvalued tangible assets that were bid up only because of speculative um, bank-induced uh, uh, credit extension or credit expansion, you know, those are all coming back down to much more realistic levels. You had said that the central banks were diversifying out of the dollar. This is in 2009. And my question to you is, how do you know that? How does anybody know that? Well, you just see the central banks that are buying physical gold. Um, I can't. I guess uh, it was after that that the Chinese announced another acquisition uh, at their central bank of, of, of physical gold. Um, there are other central banks around the world that have been accumulating physical gold. Um, so if you're accumulating physical gold, you're avoiding the U.S. dollar. There are some people that believe that because there's not enough above the ground stock of gold that you can't really create or go back to a gold based economy do you agree obviously you disagree with that right but yeah, why why yeah, that's that's a myth um there is enough gold it's a question of allowing it to adjust to its fair market value to its price um you know if we didn't have all of the government intervention and all of the regulations and whatnot uh yeah there would be enough gold uh you only need uh, uh, a small amount of gold, in theory, uh, to solve the world's, uh, or to serve as the world's currency. Uh, you know, once you digitalize it, like we've done in gold money, uh, you basically can, you know, could count an atom of gold if you wanted to take it, you know, down to that level. Um, because, uh, you know, money is just a thing there for counting. Uh, it's not really a wealth creating thing. You know, gold doesn't create wealth. It c cannot create wealth. It's just a sterile asset. Um, uh, it doesn't generate cash flow. It doesn't have a balance sheet. It doesn't have a management team. Uh, it's sort of like a, a place marker that enables us to perform economic calculation. Um, and uh, if the price of gold goes up, you're not actually creating wealth. That wealth has already been created by someone's hard work, and he's holding that wealth in the form of purchasing power uh, in a national currency. So when the gold price goes up, the wealth is moving from that person who holds the national currency to the person who owns gold. The purchasing power is being moved you know, from paper money into uh, sound money. Um, but it's not actually creating wealth. It's making one person who owns gold or all the people who own gold wealthier and the people who own debasing and depreciating national currency poor. Uh, but that's when you start seeing a lot of frictions and tensions in terms of society as well. And for society to act, um, uh, or to operate at its, at its best level, you need rule of law, you need sound money, because those two things interacting with one another create a level playing field. Uh, and right now we don't have a level playing field. So it's not surprising you see tensions rising around the world. You know, people say it's the rising food price, but it's really not that the price of food is rising. It's that the purchasing power of that currency is being destroyed. Let's potentiate a future in this discussion. Let us suppose that many currencies go bust and there is this opportunity to go back to a gold standard. My question to you is how do people in their minds shift from using currencies and fiat money to doing exchanges based on the weight of a metal. In other words, everything in metals is relational to most people's minds. You know, it's $10, it's $100, it's worth this or that, either it's in dollars or in euros. So when those relational currencies go bust, and then people are in a metals-based money system, isn't it going to be a major adjustment to adjust to the concept of weights as part of a payment system? Well, that's only because we're in a fiat currency bubble and people have lost sight of what money is. 
but you'll instead of talking in terms of um, uh, euros or, or cents, you'll be talking in terms of grams and, and mills. In fact, if you look at the world's major currencies, you know the pound, um, the Deutsche Mark, uh, the the franc, uh, the lira. Uh, these are all in the local language a measure of weight. That's what money is. Money has always been a measure of weight. It's only when you're in a fiat currency bubble do you lose sight of the fact that um, you know money is uh, is not a measure of weight. Now I must admit that the term dollar is a bit of a um, uh, is is the exception. It's not really a measure of weight. It was a um, a derivative from the German word for valley, because when um, uh, money started moving globally uh, after the discovery of the Americas and and the um, combin- or the merger between the Austrian Habsburgs and the Spanish thrones, the, the silver dollar um, or taler, which was the, the from the German word, you know, became a, a popular form of international money. So it wasn't really a measure of weight. But all other currencies are are, are are essentially, in the local language, a measure of weight because that's what money is. Do you think that we will see the return of Glass-Steagall? Um, I don't know. That's hard to predict what politicians are going to do in the future. Uh, what I'd like to see is the return of what, you know, uh, America was, you know, maybe... Uh, a uh, hundred years ago, in the sense that the federal government was a quaint little organization that really didn't do much but you know try to deliver the mail. Um, you know the government has far grown grown far beyond what the framers of the Constitution had ever envisioned, and I think that's you know one of the major problems that we have in in, in America today. You know, government um, share of the economy, and I'm talking about government at all levels, not just federal, but at state and and local into it is around 41% of GDP. That's higher than it was during the world, Second World War when the U.S., when government was on a war footing, you know, to win the war. Um, you know, there is no war today um, uh, other than the ones, you know, that uh, uh, the skirmishes that America is fighting in other locations. But the point I'm making is that government share of the economy is far too big. You have to remember that governments don't create wealth. They only spend what wealth is created by other people. And when you have such a high percentage of the population uh, spending what wealth has been created by a relatively small percentage of the population, uh, you ultimately lead to problems and, and, and friction. You know, re- government really shouldn't be more than 10% of GDP. It's over 40%. You know, government, just as a rule of thumb, is probably at least four times too big. It's frightening. Actually, we could actually lose our post office. Do you know that's in jeopardy here in America? You know that, right? Uh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're interested in privatizing the post office. The post office is close to being bankrupt. It's a very, very scary time here, too. Well, you know, we were talking before about the FDIC. I mean, the post office, the FDIC, no matter who you look at it, or even the federal government itself, they're all basically bankrupt. They just bankrupt uh, in everything but name. You know, they continue to operate because people think they still have uh, some ability to deliver on their promises, but financially speaking, they're you know essentially insolvent, bankrupt. Uh, um, they're never going to fulfill all of these promises, which I guess is the thing that people should really be focusing on in the future. Um, you know, any bust, and we've been in one since 2000. Promises are broken, um, and they're broken at all different levels. You know, they're broken at the commercial level. You know. Uh, Lehman Brothers broke its promises. MF Global broke its promises. Um, but, you know, the government is going to break its promises, too. It's inevitable, inevitable because the politicians have made so many promises that there's no way they're ever going to be fulfilled. And what people have to do is, is think about the consequences of that and take those steps to protect themselves when a lot of those promises are broken. It comes back down to self-reliance again you know, making making certain that you... You and your families are protected, come what may, you know, given an uncertain future. Some people have asked about MF Global. You know, MF Global was supposed to be really great, and they were managing or holding people's gold, and look what happened to them. And then they're scared to get involved, some of them, with any other type of gold uh, accumulation company. And one of the things I love about your company and what you set up is the stewardship is impeccable. 
from taking a ultrasound machine and going through every bar to make sure that it really is gold, 100% gold, to the way that it's stored in allocated storage. Talk a little bit about that and put people's concerns to rest, if you would. Yeah, I guess the best way to start that is to acknowledge that there are two types of gold. Uh, there's physical gold, you know, a tangible asset, and then there's what I call paper gold, and paper gold is a financial asset. And as I was explaining before, financial assets have counterparty risk. So when you own paper gold, you don't really own gold. You own exposure to the gold price, and your ability to um, make good on that exposure to the gold price depends on someone's promise, you know, the counterparty risk, you know, whether that person is both financially capable and willing uh, to make good to you at some point, point in time in the future when you ask them to make good to you. Physical gold, you don't have to worry about that. Now, when you when you buy physical gold, there are really only two ways to do it. You buy it and you store it yourself, or you buy it and you have someone store it for you professionally, which is you know what we do in gold money. Now, each alternative has advantages and disadvantages. When you buy it and store it yourself, you have it in hand. Um, and which is, you know, gives you a, a, a level of certainty. Um, but there are disadvantages to storing it yourself. You, you know, you won't be able to get it insured. If you would, it would cost an arm and a leg. Uh, you know, how much gold do you want to store in your in your house or you know in your garage or buried in your back uh, garden? Um, and you lack you lose liquidity when you store it yourself. If you ultimately want to um, uh, take advantage of the the, the the, the purchasing power that the gold or silver are giving you, you have to take it down to your coin dealer. Depending on what you give them, uh, they may want to refine it. That as an additional cost, there's an inconvenience factor, etc. Now, when you use professional storage, the disadvantage is that you don't have it in hand, but you have a lot of advantages. And speaking about gold money now, you can sell it 24/7 and have the proceeds wired to your bank account anywhere in the world. Um, you have the insurance, um, you have it stored in specialized bullion vaults. You can uh, obtain geographic diversification, uh, which is uh, something that I think it's advantageous as a way of mitigating uh, things uh, like risk of confiscation by storing in different vaults that we make available uh, in Canada, UK, Switzerland, and Hong Kong. Uh, you also have the audits in gold money, so you have the assurances of integrity, knowing that you're your precious metals are actually in the vault and that they're safe and secure. So what you ultimately have to do is decide what works best for you and your family. And it's probably a combination of having some physical gold around at home, but also having some physical gold stored for you professionally, um, and, you know, outside the country where you live. And, you know, that's where gold money comes in. Uh, and what you do if you want to use professional storage is make sure that the firm you choose has the types of um, security and governance features that gold money does. You know, the audits, uh, like you said, we test each bar with an ultrasound equipment to make sure they're not uh, filled, the bars that go into gold money are not filled with tungsten. And you've probably heard about this tungsten. Absolutely. There, uh, <laughs> recently. The interesting thing about gold and tungsten is that they have approximately the same specific gravity. So given the, the size and weight, they're approximately the same. Um, very, very subtle difference between the two. And, um, you know, visually, you can have a tungsten bar plated with gold and it, on the surface it looks like a gold bar. The only way you can determine that it's really pure gold is with this ultrasound equipment that we use. We're one of the few firms internationally that, that uses this, but we take this extra step to provide our customers with the assurances of integrity, knowing that we've... Um, mitigated all of the possible risks. Uh, and one of the risks is making certain that, you know, gold money doesn't get any tungsten filled bars in its system. So what you have to do again is, um, consider the advantages and disadvantages of physical gold at home, physical gold professionally stored, and then take those steps and decisions, uh, that you, um, you, you feel comfortable with. Another advantage of having professional storage, of course, is the cost um, buying physical gold through gold money is typically less expensive than buying coins or bars, you know, from your local shop. But again, you know, it's worth some, from time to time to have some physical gold at home and in, in hand, uh, you know, just in case. 
let us suppose that somebody has a gold money account and they want to liquidate some of their gold. How do they sell it? You say you can sell it. How does that work? They go online. They log into their holding. We don't use the term account uh, because that's a, a use, usually used when you have financial assets. We use the term holding to reflect the fact that um, you actually hold the um, physical gold or silver or platinum and palladium, and we're just simply acting as your agent and storing it for you as, as your instructions. So you log into your holding, um, you, you sell, uh, you choose how much of the precious metal you want to sell. Uh, we buy that from you at the spot price with no fees or no commission and the prevailing spot price. Um, and then you can actually continue to hold the precious metals in a customer segregated funds account that we maintain at UK banks in the UK. Uh, for our customers, or you can have the proceeds wired uh, to your bank account anywhere in the world. Can you have it wired in any currency you want? If I say, look, I'm selling X number of gold bars, I'd like this to be returned in X currency. Can gold money do that for me? Yeah, we deal in nine currencies, but if you wire it to your bank account in the Philippines, for example, you wire dollars to the Philippines, you'll get Philippine pesos your Philippine bank will convert those dollars into pesos for you. So as a practical matter, you can get any currency in the world. Okay. Now, I know I had asked you a few minutes back about the transaction side of gold money. I want to just go back for a moment here, and then I have two more questions. The transaction side, what happened on a regulatory level that made you retire it temporarily? Well, the regulations have just become so onerous, and given the fact that uh, so relatively few people are using it because, as I say, Gresham's law, they want to store gold rather than spend it. We just thought, you know, well, why spend all of this money, you know, following uh, uh, all of these regulations when, in fact, uh, it's, so, it's not used that often. So it's, if you live and work in Jersey, you know, where we operate from over in Europe, uh, you can still use it. And, you know, one of the things we've we've been doing is investigating ways to reestablish that payment system. And at some point in time in the future, we, we will establish it. But it's just a question of when the timing is right for that to happen. I hear you. I would like you to define austerity. It's used so much, and I think most people don't understand what it is. In your view, what is austerity and what does it mean? You mean as politicians explain it? Yes, or it's used with money, too. Well, you know, what governments are basically saying is they have to adopt all of these measures of austerity. But if you actually look at government balance sheets and income statements, uh, they're not really uh, cutting back on, on their expenditures. You know, they continue to spend the money. So there's a lot of talk going out there about austerity, but there's no action really supporting it. Uh, you know, governments are continuing to spend money they don't have. Um, and ultimately, that's what's leading to, I think, the destruction of the currency. Um, and you were on this path to what I call hyperinflation, as you know, we discussed a little bit earlier, I believe, that you know, if you turn government debt into currency, you're ultimately going to hyperinflate that currency and in the end destroy it. The LIBOR scandal that happened several months ago, I'd like you to explain briefly what it is and its impact on gold, if you feel there's been any. Well, yeah, there is a, an impact on gold, and it's tied into what I call this fiat currency bubble. But can you explain what the LIBOR scandal is to the audience? Yeah, the LIBOR is, stands for the London Interbank Offering Rate, L-I-B-O-R. And what it means is that people borrow uh, uh, money and lend money at the, at the LIBOR rate or some percentage over the LIBOR rate. The scandal was is that the rate was being rigged. Uh, by the banks who are supposed to offer a true market rate, but were offering, you know, rigged prices. And, you know, that caused a lot of distortions. Now, just to step back from that a minute to explain the relationship to gold, you have to consider what an interest rate is. Uh, interest rates are a reflection of risk of a currency. Um, and the higher the interest rate, the higher the risk, which is, of course, sort of natural. So, for example, if you look at the Indian rupee, uh, interest rates are around 11% as opposed to the South African RAND where interest rates are around 8%. And what the market is basically saying is there's a higher risk of the rupee being inflated than the South African RAND. But those currencies have a higher interest rate than uh, the U.S. dollar or the euro. Um, but the U.S. dollar and the euro, those interest rates are being rigged and manipulated by central banks. And here's how it relates to gold. 
gold always has the lowest interest rate. And the reason it has the lowest interest rate is it can't be inflated. You can't create physical gold with a printing press. You can't create physical gold by, you know, government edict. Uh, phys- uh, physical gold comes from, you know, the laborious and risky and capital intensive project of, you know, mining it from the earth's crust. Um, and because it grows at 1.8% per annum, it imposes that discipline, uh, um, that's necessary in terms of any money growing at about the same rate of world as world population growth. So historically, gold has always had the lowest interest rate, but for the past year and a half or two years or so now, the U.S. dollar and the euro's rate is lower than the gold's interest rate, which is an impossibility because that's saying the euro and the dollar have less risk than gold, which is, of course, a ridiculous uh, statement. But when you're in a bubble, you know, ridiculous things, ridiculous <laughs> statements become conventional wisdom, like I was saying before. You know, internet bubble, you know, market share, profits don't matter, only market share does, real estate bubble, uh, housing prices only go up, fiat currency bubble, interest rates on the dollar and the euro are lower than interest rates on gold. So it's created some distortions in the gold market. Uh, and um, these distortions are basically saying that, you know, gold um, is not in backwardation when in fact I think it is. Um, it's a term, backwardation and contango. Um, it, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but backwardation, it, as a practical matter, it means that people would rather own gold than national currencies, and that's exactly what's happening today. But it's not reflected in the interest rate structure and, and the pricing structure simply because of the manipulation and the rigging of the various interest rate markets around the world. Not just the LIBOR, but just you know, all currency interest rates today are basically rigged by you know, central bank um, intervention. What establishes the London fix? How is that established? The London gold fix. Yes. Who establishes that? Yeah, the, the term fix is a, a, you know, people misunderstand what it means. Uh, think of the term fix in a nautical sense, like you're fixing on some distant point that you're heading to when you're on a boat. Um, you fix on, a, on, on, on something in the distance. And what a fix does is it brings together the buyers and the sellers of physical metal uh, and in, at some point in time, the, the buyers and sellers at some price are in balance, and that's the fix. When everybody who wants to sell at that given moment and everybody wants to buy at that given moment are happy on the price, that's the fix. Is that the same as the spot price? Uh, it's, yeah, it is the same as the spot price at that one instant. At that one instant, the spot price and the fix are one and the same. But the spot price continues to trade 24 hours a day. Yeah, you know, because the market continues to trade beyond just what's done at the London fix. The London fix is basically a process where people who want to sell and, and buy large amounts of physical metal in London do so uh, at the at the fix, and they deliver or receive uh, physical metal at the fixing price because that's the way they've agreed to to trade. But the physical market will continue to operate pretty much you know all day long. It mainly operates in Europe. It doesn't really operate so much in the states. And the reason why that's the case is when the U.S. confiscated gold back in the 1930s, all of the physical trading um, went to Europe. And even though after 1974 it became legal once again for Americans to own physical gold, the physical trading you know, just stayed over there in Europe. And the U.S. is basically a paper market. Now, gold money does not do any external reporting to governments around the world because of where it's located in Jersey. And uh, you talk about how it's basically Anglo-Saxon common law property rights are protected. And at the same time, when one fills out the form to sign up with gold money, there has been a change in the form, hasn't there, in the last three to five years? Yeah, for, you know, off the top of my head, you know. For new probably, reporting but, requirements. I mean, isn't the U.S.? No, the reporting, reporting requirements are basically the, the same. You know, we follow the, the rules where we operate uh, over there in Europe. And uh, we're not allowed to, you know, report because of, you know, there's a much greater respect for privacy in Europe than there is in other parts of the world. But what we do basically is that um, we put, the, you know, we have customers in over 100 different countries around the world. It's impossible for us to follow the rules and regulations in every country. Right. So what we basically do is we put the burden on the customer. The customer has to follow the rules and regulations in the territory from which uh, that person accesses gold money. And 
as long as they follow the rules and regulations in that country, they're in compliance with our customer agreement. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that's uh, the point you're getting at. Do you think your $500,000 minimum opening requirements for a corporation to have a gold money holding account will ever get lower so that people with corporations and companies with less amount of money can get in? Um, you know, you're asking a question about the future and, um, you know, uh, probably, you know, as the economies of scale change, if you, if you've been involved with gold money from the beginning, you, you'll notice that as we get bigger and bigger and we benefit from economies of scale, we generate efficiencies within gold money and we pass those efficiencies on to others. Um, for example, we've been lowering, um, um, over time the, um, vault storage fees, you know, that we charge because we get a better fee from the vaults and we pass that better fee on to uh, our customers. So probably, but, you know, when and how, and you know, where that will happen, I, I, you know, only time will tell. I really appreciate that you do that. And I did notice that. Can you share something before we end today's interview about the work you're doing with the Gold Money Foundation? It's really been great to watch it roll <laughs> the last few years. And I watch your interviews frequently. Talk a little bit about what the foundation's doing for the audience. Yeah, the the foundation was, it's sort of a an arm that we created out of gold money a, a few years ago. And the reason why we did it is we've recognized that there's a terrible misunderstanding of what gold is and you know what its role is in society. Um, and so we created Gold Money as a not-for-profit educational organization. And what we've been trying to do is to make information available on, uh, on gold you know, that people would uh, find educational and useful and help them to understand um, more about gold's role and generally about you know, the monetary systems that we have around the world. And the next, as I alluded to earlier, the, the next report that's coming out of the foundation is this report, which will be available uh, uh, this month, called the Above, uh, Above Ground Gold Stock, Its Importance and Its Size. Uh, and you can go to goldmoneyfoundation.org. That should be up there later this month if you want to download it. All of the work that we do for the foundation is available free, um, as this report will be available free. Um, and, you know, you can... Um, download it and circulate it to as many people as you would like, because we think the more people who understand the importance of gold, um, the, the better off uh, human society is going to be, the better off our society and our civilization is going to be. Well, it's been a real pleasure to bring you back, and I'm not going to let you get away from me for three years. <laughs> okay. Let's <laughs> coordinate travel schedules and things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to James Turk, the founder of Gold Money at goldmoney.com and the chairman of the Gold Money Foundation. If you'd like to open your account, we'd appreciate it if you go through its rainmaking time. There's a box with gold money on the right-hand side of the site. We're an affiliate. We believe in gold money. We believe in sound money. And we appreciate you listening. Also, go to goldmoney.com. Read as much as you can. Share it with your friends. James Turk, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kim. And let me just say one thing about the affiliate program. We're very pleased that you are an affiliate. And when someone signs up through an affiliate like yourself, it's the exact same as if someone were coming to gold money directly. So we really encourage people to sign up through affiliates because you're basically uh, enabling and encouraging affiliates around the world to um, put out information about gold that's useful to every individual. So I hope your affiliate uh, uh, arrangement uh, will be very successful. Thanks so much. Thanks for everything you've put together. Thank you, Kim.